Um, I want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to our side event this afternoon, um, at least this afternoon where all of uh, uh, the panelists are sitting. Um, and uh, so whatever time zone you're joining us from, we are pleased that you can join us today for our very special side event, Achieving UN Declaration Implementation Legislation in Canada. And I am absolutely honored and delighted to serve as your moderator this afternoon. And I, um, I'm delighted because I look forward very much uh, to hearing our speakers this afternoon and what they will have to tell us. So I am Cheryl Lightfoot and I am Anishinaabe from the Lake Superior Band of Ojibwe. I am the uh, one of the newest members of the, I'm the North American member uh, of the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples. I have been in this role for just uh, over six eight weeks now. So very new and I'm delighted to be uh, participating in my very first uh, session of the expert mechanism. Um, I am in my day job a Canada Research Chair of Global Indigenous Rights and Politics at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, where I'm also Associate Professor in Political Science the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs and Indigenous Studies. And I'm joining you this afternoon, um, unusual uh, for me at the moment, but I'm joining you from the overlapping and sometimes contested borderlands of the Anishinaabe and Dakota peoples, what we often refer to right now as Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, I am spending the week here uh, because the border uh, between Canada and the United States opened up just, just a tad so that I could come home and see extended family for the week and hug my mother for the first time in 18 months. So I'm uh, joining you virtually from uh, the place uh, that we call where the two great rivers meet, uh, which to, uh, to us is um, the, the creation story, uh, that's our origin, and uh, for us it's the center of the universe. So I'm only about five kilometers from that place right now. It's a very sacred place. So it's, it's my honor to be joining you this morning from this place. And our host today for this event uh, is the Coalition for the Human Rights of Indigenous People. And this is uh, a group, it's a nonpartisan group of indigenous peoples and human rights organizations that have been working together for a number of years seeking the full implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Canada. And um, I came to work with the coalition uh, a few years back and uh, we are growing in our efforts to build links between uh, Indigenous academics and non-Indigenous academics who work in this area, and then also the organizations and activists that form the coalition. So I'm very delighted to be a part of this emerging and growing partnership, and so happy to uh, play this this role today. And you can find much more about the coalition on the website, uh, and it is declarationcoalition.ca and I believe that can be dropped in the chat as well and you can find more information about the coalition as well as some resources. Now the legislation of course is one of the the big news stories of the last couple of months in, in Canada because after years of advocacy and work by Indigenous peoples and advocates and allies, very recently, June 21st, which was National Indigenous Peoples Day in Canada, Royal Assent was conferred on an act respecting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And Romeo Saginash, who had previously as a member of parliament tabled a federal uh, implementation bill that never reached completion has said, the UN Declaration is a powerful human rights instrument precisely because indigenous peoples were full partners in its development. 
And he continued that this new implementation act brings that same spirit of cooperation to the vital work of turning the declaration's provisions into action. And Romeo said, it may be a government bill, but it is our victory. And the act requires the federal government to take all measures necessary going forward to ensure that the laws of Canada are consistent with the provisions of the UN Declaration. And it will also require that a national action plan to implement the declaration through law, policy, and various programs be developed and adopted within a two-year time frame. The implementation measures that are required under this act must be taken, and this is crucially important, in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples. And the act then following requires public reporting on progress as well as accountability measures developed in collaboration again with Indigenous peoples. Now, before I introduce the three very distinguished speakers on our panel, I want to address just a couple of housekeeping notes. So we have a total of 90 minutes for this virtual side event. So I'm going to invite each speaker in turn to take the floor for up to 15 minutes to share uh, whatever stories and perspectives you would like to share in that time. And because we are limited in time, um, I will put up one hand uh, when we have three minutes left in the 15 minutes. And when time is up, I will just raise both hands so that you'll have a visual signal. And that's just to make sure that uh, everyone has an equal chance to speak and that we also have uh, time for questions and answers. And for the Q&A, you will notice uh, that we have a Q&A button just on the bottom of your screen, uh, slightly to the left of center, or to the right of center as you're facing the screen. And uh, you should feel free to drop questions in that Q&A, and we will draw from them once the speakers have finished their opening statements. And I will remind everyone of uh, that as the speakers move through with their presentations. So it's my honor now to introduce our panel of speakers. We will open this afternoon uh, first with Cheryl. So we're going to work in reverse order from what was on the poster. We're going to move uh, from the bottom up. And we'll begin with Cheryl Knockwood who is Mi'kmaq from the Indian Island First Nation in New Brunswick. And she is currently serving as the chair of the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. She's also the governance coordinator for the Memberto First Nation in Nova Scotia. Following Cheryl will be Ellen Gabriel. And Ellen is an artist, an activist, and well known for her work as a spokesperson for her nation uh, quite a few years ago now during the o Oka crisis. And Ellen works with the Mohawk Language Custodian Association working to preserve language and is also part of the Indigenous Climate Action Steering Committee. Ellen has coordinated the translation of the declaration into her language, working with elders and traditional knowledge holders. And then finally, our third speaker will be Grand Chief Willie Littlechild, who's a Cree lawyer and former Grand Chief of the Confederacy of Treaty Six First Nations. He was North American representative to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, as well as a former member from North America of the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. He's also one of the former three commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, and a member of eight sports halls of fame, including Canada's Sports Hall of Fame. So with that, I would like to turn over the floor to Cheryl Knockwood uh, for your opening presentation. And again, one hand for three minutes, two hands for uh, time. Thank you, Cheryl. Hello, Ali. Walali na msidwen dawen jiksidu i pige. Walali o iginem wio a yish opportunity skudu man nako i dandoji 
Gilok, an important day. Um, so uh, in my language, I just said, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, be part of this panel. Uh, and uh, and I, I want to acknowledge that I am sitting in Mi'kmaq territory. Um, uh, the place I'm at right now is uh, a little narrow, as it was known as a, the summer home. One of the many summer places where we as Mi'kmaq camped um, in the summer and in the Bredore Lakes, uh, Waikagama Bay right here in front of me is where my ancestors and um, my current generations of Mi'kmaq still uh, harvest uh, our, our, our food. Uh, there's uh, trout and um, plenty of other species that we um, um, access from the Bredour Lakes here. So it's an honor for me to be here and, I'm, and, and, and I want to acknowledge, uh, and uh, secondly, I want to acknowledge that um, I want to give thanks to all the Indigenous peoples all over the world who worked hard decades, decades, uh, to get the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, they lobbied for it internationally. Uh, you know, many of, many of the Indigenous people that travel to the international forums, uh, you know, did not have the resources to be able to do this, but found the resources to be able to attend uh, and lobby for the rights that are outlined within the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And, I am. Uh, I want to acknowledge and honor uh, those indigenous peoples who played a role, uh, so that uh, you know, states such as Canada um, um, and others, hopefully, uh, can now pass uh, state-led legis legislation. I should say, so that they can implement the, the rights and all the articles outlined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and. Um, one of the things uh, uh, I, I also want to, I'm looking forward to, um, now that uh, the Bill C-15 is law, I want to I, I want to acknowledge the work of, uh, you know, Romeo Saganash and his team of individuals who worked hard to, in, to ensure that this, uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People uh, was implemented within Canada. So, walaliak, walaliak, walaliak. Uh, and now it's up to us, the Indigenous people in Canada, the non-Indigenous people in Canada, and all Canadians uh, to work towards implementing this legislation in a, in, 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 with the spirit and intent of what uh, the declaration means. So uh, when, I, when I see the uh, press releases from Canada, once this law uh, once it became law in Canada on National Indigenous Peoples Day, is that they were going to take all measures, all measures, and I and I and I underline all measures necessary to ensure the laws of Canada are consistent. So now it's up to us as Indigenous people to um, analyze the laws within Canada and advocate for. Uh, all those laws in Canada to ensure that uh, those laws are consistent with uh, the declaration. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that Canada will be preparing an action plan uh, with uh, in involvement with us. So, you know, we have a responsibility to start preparing for um, and doing that analysis to start preparing to ensure that the action plan is reflective truly of what uh, this all measures that will be necessary to ensure that all laws within Canada are, are consistent with the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, I want to highlight that uh, Canada said that they would uh, they want to address injustices. Yeah, you know, that's one of the areas they said they want to address uh, in injustices. They want to combat prejudice. Uh, they want to eliminate yeah. eliminate all forms of violence, racism, and discrimination uh, against Indigenous peoples. And they want to promote uh, mutual respect and understanding through human rights education. Um, and so we as Indigenous peoples and all Canadians uh, uh, need to push the envelope because we all know uh, that uh, with what 
Canada has done systematically has been the opposite of that previous to this legislation. Uh, systematically, they've created the Indian Act, uh, which was they, they've implemented policies that uh, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls uh, inquiries said were genocidal, uh, that were meant to uh, eliminate us as Indigenous peoples. Uh, and so uh, they encouraged violence and racism and discrimination against all Indigenous peoples. So uh, the action plan to, uh, that Canada will be working on uh, uh, with, in partnership with Indigenous people, uh, if, if the goal is to address the injustices, then there needs to be structural and systematic change that needs to happen in all level in terms of how the relationship between uh, the um, over um, 600 nations, First Nations that there are within Canada, with Canada. Um, and um and I'm heart, and, and I'm looking forward to see when they say they're gonna mo they're gonna create something to monitor, uh, and do oversight, and follow up, um, and 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 provide recourse and remedy to Indigenous peoples to ensure that the uh, declaration is implemented. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to see what that will involve, because currently, when um, in, I can speak from the Mi'kmaq perspective. Um, if it wasn't for individual Mi'kmaq uh, men and women continuing to practice their Mi'kmaq treaty rights to harvest, to fish, uh, to hunt, and um, continue to bring up the treaties for the last over 200 years since we signed our treaties, um, if it wasn't for Mi'kmaq individuals continuing to bring those treaties to Canada and saying, you need to recognize these, we signed them, we signed them with, uh, you know, European uh, nation of uh, the British government, which you inherited the responsibilities of these treaties. If uh, Canada ignored those treaties up until 1985, until the first decision uh, that was uh, decided uh, um, the Queen and versus Simon um, that first recognized the Treaty of 1752 at that time for us, uh, for us as Mi'kmaq for the right to hunt. So um, what, do, what I'm hoping for in this action plan is, uh, is for Canada to review all the Mi'kmaq treaties and give all of them recognition without us having to go to court to get recognition. Uh, 1985, we got our first treaty recognized. 1999, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada recognized our 1760, 61 treaties. They were a series of treaties that were signed within the various districts within the Mi'kmaq Nation. And uh, within those treaties, um, uh, Supreme Court of Canada recognized, and it was signed not just with the Mi'kmaq, it was signed with the Willis de Buyig and the Passamaquoddy. Uh, nations as well. And uh, within those treaties, it, the Supreme Court of Canada recognized the right to the Mi'kmaq, Mal, uh, Passamaquoddy, and the Willis de Buyig to for a moderate livelihood um, in our harvesting, fishing, and gathering um, activities. And so 20 years later, we're, we still have Mi'kmaq fishermen being charged under the fisheries regulations when they're practicing their moderate livelihood rights. That needs to stop. Canada needs to, uh, in implementing the um, Bill C-15 and uh, looking at ways to address injustices, well, they need to recognize Canadian law uh, the, um, and made by the highest level of Canadian justice courts and systems, i.e. the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, that recognize the Mi'kmaq treaties uh, and give them full meaning and recognition and not interfere with that. They need to come to sit with our leadership and give uh, respect and honoring to our leadership, our, our chiefs, our grand councils, our Wabanaki confederacies, and recognize our ancient, uh, we, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, and when I say ancient, I mean, we've had uh, since time immemorial, 
Uh, we've lived in Mi'kma'ki. We've managed the resources in Mi'kma'ki. We've ensured that the resources were protected. And, you know, the, we didn't look at uh, the fish and the birds and the trees um, um, as resources. In fact, we looked at them as kin and we protected uh, the fish and, and, and the trees and, and everything within Mi'kma'ki. And we looked at them as kin, as family. And as such, we uh, protected that relationship and we protected our, our kin. So uh, when, we're, when Canada is, is looking at our fishers and our leadership today, they need to respect that uh, you know, knowledge that we've had since time immemorial to ensure that we protect the, our, our kin, our, our, our land and, our, and, 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 our, and, the re, and, and, and the fish and the birds and the trees. So I think we may even have lessons we could share with Canada on how to resource to manage, uh, the, you know, what they say is, uh, you know, how to manage the resources. Um, I think we have lessons that we could share uh, with Canada about how to properly take care of our kin and uh, ensure that there is continued survival of all uh, uh, within Mi'kma'ki. And when I mean all, I mean our kin, the trees, the, the animals, um, and the birds for future generations. Um, so when we're talking about um, uh, addressing injustices, we need to make sure that this current Supreme Court of Canada decisions uh, within Canada's own highest law needs to be fully upheld and given full meaning. And uh, that's one area, and there's many. And one of the things, I'm not, sh not sure about my time, but the other thing I wanted to highlight was uh, Bill C-15 has been said by Canada that it's um, a shared roadmap. And when I look at... Uh, uh, Bill C-15 and, and its implementing of the United Nations Declarations of the Rights of Indigenous People, I see 46 journeys. I see 46 road trips uh, that Canada needs to embark on with all the Indigenous peoples across Canada. And, you know, there's themes. Yes, uh, you know, there's uh, 10 articles related to self-determination. Um, so 10 journeys there. Uh, there's 10... Um, articles related to the rights to protect culture through practices, the language, the education, media, and religion. There's 10 journeys, uh, road trips there that we can take with Canada. Uh, when we're talking about uh, Indigenous people's right uh, to governance and economic development, well, there's seven articles. So there's seven uh, road trips there that we, we, that, that, uh, we need to embark on with Canada. Health rights, there's two road trips. Uh, protection of subgroups, one road trip, uh, land rights, uh, six road trips. So there's, we need just, we all we need to do when we're looking at roadmaps is look at the declaration, look at those articles. It, it lays out very clearly what those, where, where the final destination um, for each of these road trips uh, will be and where we're going. And, um, you know, just to highlight language, for instance, um, one of the things uh, Canada has been responsible for, as I mentioned earlier, was the systemic um, oppression of Indigenous peoples in, and their culture and uh, an approach to, uh, uh, you know, systematically uh, um, kill the language. And uh, luckily, it was not successful. Canada, you failed. I can speak my language, but there's many other Indi in Indigenous people in this world that can't and within Canada. And I think Canada has to be responsible to fund, you know, when we're talking about eliminating, you know, we got to eliminate the systems Canada created to uh, start this. So they have to fund the new systems that are going to do language promotion. And, and, and every community, uh, every First Nation community should have funded 
by Canada um, uh, language immersion schools. They work, they work. So fund that. The residential schools, uh, you know, you funded that how many years and how many decades and how many children did you put through that and how many children didn't go home, you know? Fund the language immersion schools within the communities and fund it for the kids, for all the kids for the future generations. That's one step you can do. You know, that's one in, in terms of implementation. Uh, compensation of land. Compensate Indigenous nations for all the land that was stolen, right? It was stolen. You know, internationally, everyone's already talked about the doctrine of discovery. It was created as a legal justification to steal the land from Indigenous peoples. It wasn't based on anything just. It wasn't based on anything moral. And it wasn't based on anything legal. It was something created to justify the stealing of land. So Canada has to make a statement and follow up that statement with action. And that action is compensate for all the hundreds of years that Canada has used the resources, given out licenses to corporations to use the resources and um, share the, give the compensation back to Indigenous people. Once compensation is given, Canada does not need to, you know, they need to continue funding the use of the land. So um, those are the two areas I wanted to focus on specifically when I'm talking about roadmaps and, 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 share and, and journeys and where we need to go in. Just two areas, uh, language immersion, schools, and compensation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Cheryl, um, and spot on time. Thank you so much. But always appreciate that as a moderator. So I just want to say thank you. And now I'm delighted to turn over the floor to Ellen Gabriel. So Ellen, I look forward to hearing the thoughts you're going to share with us. Um, so I wanted to start off in my language and I wanted to thank you all for inviting me. And uh, before I, I, I start, I just wanted to greet and to thank you know, all, the, all the life forces, the natural life cycles, the creator, the mother earth and on all our relations uh, for another day of living here on this beautiful little blue planet. Um, so I was asked to, to be part of this panel to discuss why I thought it was important to um, celebrate Bill C-15, which is now a law, it's no longer a bill. Uh, and this implementation of the UN Declaration upon which uh, many generations of Indigenous people had hoped for. Because what the reality is, is that Canada does not respect our rights. Canada does not recognize our rights. Only on this arbitrary and unilateral interpretation of the law of what they consider is our rights. They talk about inherent rights and they talk about self-government, but they also at the same time uh, don't believe what they say. It's, this is just another token term used to undermine and dispossess indigenous people of their lands, their languages and their cultures. The genocide to me, as far as I'm concerned, is still going on. I think that we are over-policed, over-researched. We are still viewed as inferior to the colonizer and their values and their way of life. So if this is going to be a useful tool, and I say this with all honesty, is that I had hopes and I have hopes for this legislation to change the realities that indigenous people face, which is over-criminalization which is the erasure of our history, 
in the Indian residential schools. And now we find out that those little, little children that were killed in Indian residential school, they were murdered. Their bodies are now speaking because we have not forgotten them as much as Canada would like us to forget them. And I wanna talk about these issues and then go to the solutions. And I wanna give my condolences to all those communities who have so far been able to recover the bodies of the, the, the little ones that never came home. And to, to say that, you know, our grief, we are nations who are grieving and we are persistently being forced to protect our lands, our territories and our resources. And if this is a legislation that Canada will finally respect and implement, then I am happy. And if there is a way for government bureaucrats to step back and let us speak, let us be the ones who lead the way, not your framework, but a decolonial framework, a decolonial framework that, in, that has the respect and inclusion of indigenous laws. And people talk about a decolonial framework, which they say the UN Declaration is, and I do believe that it is. But let's talk about indigenous law for a second. What does that mean, a decolonial framework? Well, it means that the rights of the people are respected, that every single person is part of the solution, that they educate themselves on the reality in the colonial genocide that happened here in the Americas, not just in Canada, but throughout the Americas. That everyone becomes part of the solution, but also that Indigenous law is not just about human rights, but it's about environmental rights. And as Cheryl was talking about, all our relations from the waters to the fish, to the plants, the trees, the birds, and all the ones in the heavens, the thunderers who come to cleanse the earth. You know, our grandmother moon who lights the sky and, and affects us inside because she's our relation. She is reaching out to us in that energy and our elder brother, the son, as according to Rodinu says, I'm a, I'm a person of the longhouse and the people of the longhouse. Uh, our elder brother, the son who shines and gives us all energy and good health. You know, as a, as a Rodinu says, or as you know, as commonly known as, as, as Haudenosaunee people, the women are the title holders to the land. And this is a framework that I think will help restore the authority and the roles of indigenous women have to play in decision-making processes, but also about how we are going to care for the land. And I've heard this cliche, it's become a cliche now, but it's an ancestral teaching, which I don't think people really understand, which is the face is not yet born. The seven generations from now, who will be coming after us and will have to endure the climate change that we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg right now in British Columbia and in the Western provinces. These are the kinds of things when we talk about a decolonial framework. It's not just about a national plan of action. I don't care. As long as you respect our rights, as long as you drop all the charges against land defenders, like Skylar Williams and the people at Six Nations, like the people out in the who are trying to protect the, the tar sands. Uh, and I and you know, when we think about all the people who have been fighting against indigenous people's human rights and what indigenous law stands for, I am hoping that this legislation will actually be implemented and respected in the way that it was in the spirit that it was meant to be which is re respecting the rights of indigenous people's right to self-determination. Our rights, not just to meet with third parties who are just going to tap us on the head and say, nice little Indians, you, we are looking for your consent. You do not seek our consent. You need our consent before you go forward. And I've asked this to Mark Miller and I have asked this to Carolyn Bennett. Place a moratorium on all development that's happening in Canada so that we can have a break, so that we can rest. Because I am fed up with the BS that I hear from the Prime Minister that we are his most important relationship. Maybe this legislation is a step forward, but at the same time, our people are being criminalized. And so that's why I said I would support 
I would support that this, this legislation because I'm fed up. I'm sick and tired of Indigenous people having to always push and become part of a barricade when we should be at home as artists, as poets, as musicians, as the knowledge keepers, transferring our languages. That's not the reality we're facing. And I'm sorry, I cannot wait for a national action plan because until up to this time, this very moment, traditional governments that have survived colonization are not included because we are not recognized as the authorities over our lands and our people. It is band councils that are recognized as the authority. And they are, they are just elected as popular votes. It's a popularity contest. So traditional indigenous law would go against that. And we would have a democracy that recognizes not just human rights, but the rights of the environment, the rights of the fish, the rights of the water, and all those beautiful things that make us who we are as one way people. Canada cannot continue to arbitrarily say that they're going to, what, what's the, the right word, collaborate. I have never seen anybody collaborate in Canada. I have seen them tick the box that they spoke to us. I have been at meetings where there are five Indigenous people and 35 bureaucrats. A decolonial framework would not allow that. And you talk about leaders, the people are the leaders under Rodinuses Haga or Rodinusoni law. The Kayanarat Serat go with a great shining piece. Not the band councils. It is the traditional people who have been excluded, and it is the traditional people who have the treaties, not band councils. And so this, I hope, is going to change that relationship because the praxis of the relationship right now is the Indian Act. And the Indian Act has got to go, but people are so tethered to it because really the Indian Act has created a framework for service providing. That's all it's done. It has not created anything that respects our rights to self-determination. And as we speak, more land is being taken. That land theft continues. And, and during this, this moment where we're celebrating a legislation that can help us, it is simultaneously taking away the rights of this generation and future generations from enjoying the land. There has been no instances that I can think of right now where any Supreme Court has actually been implemented, Supreme Court decisions, because the justice system in Canada and its provinces and territories is not for Indigenous people. It's, it's designed to continue to oppress. So we need a justice system that is not related to the government and the provincial and federal laws that continue to oppress our people. We have a trust relationship. No, we have a, a relationship where we are wards of the state and Canada decides how much allowance we're going to get. We don't trust Canada. We maybe never have. But the fact is, there is no trust in Canada. So Canada, if you are going to implement this, you're going to have to step up to the plate. Because I believe that there is such a thing as law and order. But right now, the balance has been upset. The balance is not there. We are teetering uh, on a more imbalanced way of life pre prior and informed consent. This is something that, the, that we have an inherent right to and which is supported in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. But it has not been respected simply because of the dysfunctional form that we are existing under the Indian Act, under band council systems in which government demands of the band councils to have discretion to not inform the community of any kind of actions that are going on at the table. So there's another dysfunction. We need to stop what is going on in Canada. And I'm hoping that this legislation is going to be that door that will open and finally respect the rights of indigenous peoples. Because as, as of today, we are under stress. We are re-traumatized by the young children whose bodies are being found in unmarked graves and who are murdered because they, the residential 
school, the court ordered residential school agreement and apology allowed the criminals who committed these atrocities against indigenous children to walk free amongst us. They may be older, but they are walking amongst us. If there are human rights standards to be met, Canada has not met them when it comes to indigenous people. Maybe this will be the time where they will recognize their international human rights obligations. We must follow our indigenous laws and we have been following our indigenous laws. I'm kind of wondering what kind of laws have Canada, has Canada been following? Because it's not human rights. It's not all these wonderful UN uh, words on paper that they have legal obligations to. Industry also exploits the colonial rooted divisions that exist because of the colonial dysfunction, because of what has happened in Canada and its, and its entities. I want to have hope because without hope, there is just despair, there is just depression, and there is just anger. And I want us to be able to move past that. Will this legislation help? I certainly think it's a, a move in the right direction. I don't think that the bureaucrats in Canada um, are willing to let go uh, and, and the PMO's office are willing to let go control over what they have had. We have become an industry, for an economic industry for people in government. We are the first peoples of this land. We know who she is. We know our creation stories. And we know who we are as Indigenous people. We don't need Canada to, to tell us what our identity is. We know it. Our mother and all our relations is worth more than money. It is invaluable, it is priceless. And so uh, I guess my time is up. Um, and um, I wanna say that to all my relations out there who are struggling against the powers that be, I am with you, I stand next to you. Uh, to the police who are always monitoring us, give us a break, back off. It is time for Indigenous people's rights to be respected. It is time for our voices to be heard and for the truth to be heard about the atrocities that the police have committed against Indigenous people and that the government and its institutions uh, and the monarchy in England have committed against Indigenous people. If peace is what you want, then have the courage to step forward and be uncomfortable in the peace that we all desire. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, and I appreciate you as well, um, doing me a favor as a moderator and keeping so beautifully to time. Thank you. Um, and then I would like to invite our, our third speaker, uh, Chief Willie Littlechild. And Willie, um, I, I gave housekeeping comments early on uh, before you could join us. I'm giving one hand at three minutes uh, and then two hands when our time is up, just so you have a visual cue uh, because it's so easy for us all to lose track of time sometimes when we're telling our, our stories and our experiences. And that's actually what I'm hoping you'll do with us today, Willie, is talk to us about the experience of law and, and achieving this law and what it means to you um, having been involved in this work for so many years. So I'd like to turn over the floor to you, Chief Littlechild. Thank you very much. Nivan Kakio Petam Skarnao. My can mortal and cigars and mascotti see what's in here. Exe Tomao Mangaga Simon Maganigan Semento, not in an asthma. He in a magona 
ko tak tiskal in in Yosik. I just bring you greetings in my language and apologize for being late. But um, uh, elders called me to a meeting this afternoon as we are just beginning our journey at um, my community, which was at one point in Canada, the largest uh, residential school. So the emotional challenge that we're embarking on was just yesterday and they called me back today for ceremony so I apologize for that but as far as this topic is concerned I can only uh, say that um, uh, personally what I was involved with um, was a very long journey after instructions from the elders in my community who were after several ceremonies and frustration I suppose despair decided that we have to go back to the international arena because they said our treaty is being breached at will by our treaty partner almost on a daily basis. So you have to go with four instructions uh, to the international arena. So that was in August of 1977 when I started this journey. Uh, first at the ILO, the International Labor Organization to amend Convention 107 to what is now Convention 169. And the information I had going into that meeting was from the second World Indigenous Peoples Conference in Karuna in Sweden, that same, actually just a month before. So after working on the uh, convention, uh, to get started on amending the outdated 105, 107. We were told that we could not talk about civil and political rights at the ILO because it was a labor convention and civil and political rights are to be discussed at the United Nations. And just as Great Spirit works in mysterious ways. There happened to be a meeting on discrimination against indigenous peoples and this possession of our lands conference uh, scheduled. Um, so I went there um, with the four instructions that I did receive from the elders. And in 1982, of course, uh, was the start of a working group to begin discussing uh, the place of indigenous peoples at the UN because we couldn't get in to begin with at the United Nations. It was only through a peaceful walk in to the UN that we were able to access the international arena but that took 27 years, as you all know, to get the declaration adopted in Geneva. And then 12 more years after that, uh, when it went to New York and sometime after uh, Canada decided to change their vote from a no to a yes, uh, activities began at home in my community. We were involved all the way through from day one on the uh, ILO Convention 169 and then the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And then also the Organization of American States 
Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, so my personal goals actually were four. One was to um, try to achieve treaty When I went back to them after many years of discussion, um, or not discussion, but uh, presentations, interventions at the UN, I came back one day and I said, yes, I just came back from the UN and we're still uh, trying to convince the UN we're human beings. And that was an eight year discussion and one of the elders said, well, what are we then? Are we animals? Are we a herd of elk or moose? What are we? And then he said something profound. He said, I know why they do not want to recognize us as human beings. Because if they do, they have to admit we have human rights. And that was really important because it linked with the 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights, we were where we were left out. So basically, he was right on. And that's why so many thousands, actually millions of indigenous peoples were being killed as uh, being non -in, a non-human being or a person without human rights. So treaty implementation was a goal. They had said, all we want is recognition, respect, and justice. That's all we want. And as you know, the UN declaration, the article, purpose article of the declaration says it's for the survival, the dignity, and well-being of indigenous peoples. So those have been my guidelines all these years that I've been going to the UN, going to ceremony first before we left, coming back to ceremony just like this afternoon when we came back. So one more item that we're still working on, um, and that is the direct, meaningful, and effective participation of Indigenous peoples at the UN, which is also an agenda item here that I see. But to go back to the journey as far as the declaration, I'm only talking again about our community. What we did when Canada changed its vote to support and endorse the declaration without qualification, we sat down and mapped out an eight step implementation plan. And those eight steps were at the governance level. The first one was for governments, First Nations or indigenous governments to adopt the UN declaration themselves, acting as governments. Secondly, to include the UN declaration in our constitutions. So for a very long time now, the Hermanskin Cree Nation constitution has had in it a paragraph that adopted and endorsed the UN Declaration and the OAS Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, along with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, both international covenants acting, as I say, as an indigenous government. The third objective we had, and we're still working on this, and there's movement, at least in British Columbia, as you know, was to work with provincial governments and to try and seek their support and endorse the declaration as provincial governments. And I know Manitoba had drafted uh, legislation at one point uh, Vancouver or British Columbia actually adopted their own uh, 
legislation on the UN Declaration. But the fourth one is the one that we're working on right now. And that was to consider an implementation act at the federal level. In doing that, we suggested as a fifth step to utilize all relevant parliamentary committees, whether there was the indigenous affairs committees or human rights committees, international law committees, both in the House of Commons and at the Senate, and also other international fora, like the World Trade Organization, World Intellectual Poverty Organization, all of these other uh, international treaty bodies, for example, the Universal Periodic Review, the uh, CEDAW, the uh, Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination Against Women, Convention on Rights of the Child, as I say, we adopted that. So we uh, added onto that co co common number 11, as far as Indigenous children, which I mentioned yesterday, because that's specific to Indigenous children. And we, as a sixth step, thought it was very important at the academic level for the UN Declaration to be in the curriculum at all schools and all colleges and universities where they should be teaching the UN Declaration. And that's beginning to happen and has been happening in some areas uh, in the past. But one of the most important parts as a step, one of our, the seventh step in our eight step plan was at the local level. And that was to educate our own members and our own staff at the administrative level about the UN Declaration and all these other international laws, norms and standards. And then lastly, with private industry, um, the whichever industry it was, financial industry or natural resource industry, we suggested to that they ensure in their policies and core operational activities to include the UN declaration and provide education for their management and staff. And that's been happening as well. Um, not only in the private industry, but in government. For example, in the city of Edmonton, all the staff have to study not only treaties, but the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And at the provincial level, all 2,700 staff members have gone through training on the UN Declaration and on treaties so that um, not only were we focusing on outside bodies, but internally um, we've done our work. For example, we've declared our language Cree to be the official language in our territory. Then we took over our 11 schools and made it mandatory that all children study Cree, our language, the UN Declaration and the treaties. So we have tried along this road since Canada adopted the declaration without qualification to be doing our share of the lifting, the lifting, the heavy lifting that needs to be done in our own communities. Uh, so you see, for example, at the national level, the Assembly of First Nations, no resolution goes on the floor unless it's attached to one or more relevant um, articles of the UN Declaration. 
I mentioned the OAS declaration because that's more recent and that only applies in the Americas, North, Central, South America. And the articles are the starting point for that declaration was the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But as you know, the rule of if there's two laws in place at the same time on the same subject, it's the most recent one that's the applicable one on a particular topic. And let me use treaty, for example. Article 36 of the UN Declaration, uh, 37, I'm sorry, says the treaties must be honored, respected, and enforced by states. And it goes on that it can, cannot be uh, um, amended unilaterally and so on. But what was missing from the elders' perspective was that English is not the only uh, version of treaty. Oral testimony is very important. And so is indigenous understanding of treaty. So in the OAS Article 23, it includes the UN phrase of treaties must be honored, respected, and uh, enforced. But it goes on to say, according to the original spirit and intent of treaty, and also as understood by indigenous peoples. So that article is the one we use because it's the most recent and it takes into account the elders view of the treaty, how we as Cree nation, Cree peoples understand our treaty. And then of course, the ceremonies, the spiritual aspect of treaty, the what have the courts said about treaty and also the uh, ceremonial aspect of treaty and the written, of course. So we move from the UN article combined it with the OAS declaration to make the dream of the original dream of the elders in my community when they sent me to the international arena to be the applicable article in our constitution. So we have both in there. And uh, I think I'll stop there because it's uh, 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 40, uh, 43 years and a uh, few minutes to, to um, talk about it. But I wanted to talk about what we do at my community instead of just relying on government or waiting for government. We went ahead before Canada even ratified or endorsed the declaration. Uh, we already did it in our constitution. Thank you very much, Chief Little Child. Um, and I invite all the panelists uh, to turn on videos because I'm gonna lead us off with some questions. Um, and um, I invite any one of you to uh, take the first stab at the, the, the questions that I would like to ask, because I know uh, many of the attendees, um, some are likely from Canada and others are from many other places around the world and probably have burning questions about this legislation. So let's start out and just ask, what do you think is the advantage in getting this legislation? Where does it take us that we wouldn't be without this legislation? Can you, can you repeat that? Yes. Uh, what What's the advantage in us having this legislation? What work does it do for us? What do we hope it's going to do for us? I'll take a stab at answering that uh, first. Thank um, you, Cheryl. When I um, was reading through the information and I was seeing that it may provide us as Indigenous people other remedies 
uh, within the Canadian judicial system. I, I, I I'm, think, I'm hoping that it provides something better than what we currently have because, um, like I mentioned earlier, as Mi'kmaq people, we've uh, successfully um, argued for and won Supreme Court of Canada decisions on our treaty rights, and yet Canada has still not implemented them. So where do we go once we have these Supreme Court of Canada decisions and they're not being implemented by Canada? What do we do next? So I'm, I'm hoping that the other levels of recourses that uh, is mentioned within um, Canada's statement uh, when, it, when, when, when the, um, Bill C-15 became law will provide us as Mi'kmaq and probably other Indigenous nations uh, are facing similar types of issues. Like, where do we go once we have the highest law of Canada recognizing one of our rights that are not being implemented? Where do we go next? Hopefully that'll be where we go. So, um, and the other, the only other thing I want to say is hope. Like, I really loved what Ellen had mentioned earlier, you know, like if we, you know, Indigenous peoples are one of the most hopeful peoples in the, in, in the world. We have to be because we've faced so much oppression and despite that we've maintained hope. So having this piece of legislation now, that's another uh, tool that hopefully we can use as Indigenous people to uh, find justice. Thank you, Cheryl. I'll turn to Ellen next. Yeah, I, I think the, the one of the hopes that I have is that we don't have to go to Canada's courts to defend our rights. That we're no longer going to have to have to have legal fees to defend um, people who are forced into the justice system, Canada's skewed and very flawed justice system, so that um, we are able to to be the artists, the poets, the musicians, the traditional knowledge keepers, the language keepers, without having to worry about going to a barricade. And, and that's what I'm hoping is that they're going to actually open their eyes, respect us, and um, stop attacking, attacking our dignity. And that each and every person in Canada, that Canadians will start participating in their democracy instead of just voting every four years, that they're gonna actually participate, change the education system. Uh, they're going to have judges, lawyers, you know, social workers, doctors, uh, nurses, everyone will be educated so that they're not, there's no question of what to do, that they're gonna be able to know what to do so that in the future, uh, you know, those, those little ones and those babies today are not gonna have to endure what we've had to and they're not going to have to constantly be re-traumatized um, by, by what we're experiencing today uh, with the children being found in unmarked graves. So there's, you know, and I wanna see, I, I want to see that if there is a national action plan uh, and if there's an oversight committee, that it has nothing to do with the government of Canada, that it is actually human rights lawyers Indigenous academics, Indigenous lawyers, Indigenous elders, they're the ones that are going to be looking at Canada to see whether or not they've implemented this legislation properly to respect our inherent rights, because our inherent rights do not come from Canada. We don't need them to give us permission to implement our inherent rights. And um, we're right now we're being criminalized for doing that. So thanks. Thank you, Ellen. And over to you, Willie. What do, what's the advantage of having this legislation versus having no legislation at all to help implement the declaration? Well, first of all, I think that um, to go back to the point of justice and the justice system, uh, there is an article in the declaration about the juridical systems, our own, our own justice systems. And the OAS declaration goes further than that. It's the first international um, law that recognizes indigenous laws. So when you combine the juridical systems of the UN declaration being recognized and indigenous law also being recognized, we don't need to go to court, go to go to court because for example, if you look at article 27, 
28 and 40 as a cluster of the UN declaration, that's where you have your justice system within the UN declaration right now as it is. So I think that's an advantage. So we don't have to go to court. We have a mechanism within the UN declaration combined with the OS declaration that provides for indigenous justice systems to apply. Thanks all. Um, another question, which is partially coming from our attendees and, and I'm combining a couple uh, thoughts into a single question. Um, and let's go back to Cheryl to start. What sort of accountability measures might you like to see in the forthcoming action plan? Well, I, I do, I love what uh, Brooke and Little Child just said. There's uh, mechanisms we can use within the declaration that we have access to. So let's get them up and run, running and let's start that. Um, the other thing I, I thought of when I was reading this too, because it's a human rights lens and a human rights framework that may be uh, something to consider is um, giving, uh, like human rights commissions are limited uh, to what they can address based on their legislations. And I know many of the commissions across Canada um, operate from an act uh, that uh, are all probably under review uh, in the next two or three years, if not currently, because if some of the acts are 50 years old. Um, so to say that some of the some of the human rights acts are dated uh, and, and need to be updated. And I think maybe, I don't know, it's something to consider, but um, human rights education is a mandate for all the commissions uh, provincially and uh, nationally. So. And I know based on um, discussions that I've had, many of that, uh, that mandate is usually not as funded uh, um, to the extent as the, um, human, the human discriminatory human rights judicial parts of it. So maybe we need to uh, get those edu human rights education aspects of those commissions funded to a better level to allow for the systemic changes uh, that need to happen. Um, that's just something um, potentially as one option. Thanks, Cheryl. How about you, Ellen? What, what sort of accountability measures or mechanisms would you like to see uh, in the eventual action plan two years from now? <laughs> That's like I said, I don't trust government. And so I, I would, something would need to be re extremely, extremely independent. And I, I think what my answer was before is that it needs to include indigenous laws, accountability. What has it, how has their actions or inactions affected the health and well-being of the people, the environment, uh, and all the, you know, everything that we, we consider part of us uh, in, as indigenous peoples. And uh, to look at all the entities that have oppressed Indigenous people from policing to education, to the medical system, to psychologists. How are they keeping the status quo in line and how, what measures will be taken if they don't follow? Uh, the, the, the difficult part, I think, in Canada because of federalism and, you know, and the provinces um, is that there is there is there seems to be no marriage between the two uh, of who's going to implement what? Uh, so, as a distinct culture, indigenous people should be allowed to have to see that their languages, uh, the reparations of to the languages, cultures, and and land is is implemented. Um, and a national action plan it needs to include everybody. It cannot be exclusive. It can't just be NAOs. And, it, and the buck stops there as, as the status quo has been. It needs to include into the communities. And I, I think that it's, it demands a change of mind and the mindset, you know, to have a good mind. Uh, and it's hard to have a good mind when, you know, 
when we look at what's happening today in about the Indian residential school. So it's, you know, two years from now, sure, but I think let's let's start implementing it right now. That's very second, and I'm not waiting for two years. I'm going to go out there and just assert my sovereignty. Thanks, Ellen. Um, and that aligns so much with some of my own thinking lately that some of our biggest challenges in dealing with government lie in that bureaucracy. It's so sticky and it, it, it's so reticent to uh, change and shift its mindset. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm hoping that this could begin to change minds, you know, one at a time, uh, baby steps as we go. Uh, and Willie, what would you like to see looking ahead in terms of accountability measures or mechanisms? Well, there, there has to be, there must be as one of the outcomes of the National Action Plan, an independent oversight body. It has to be independent and it's gotta have, as someone says, um, it has to have teeth as an oversight body. So it's got to be an enforcement mechanism. And I think, for example, when you look at the National Council for Reconciliation, in its terms of reference, it is an independent body, arm's length uh, from um, governments or indigenous peoples, but an independent oversight mechanism to look at what's happening with reconciliation across the country. Then there's the, uh, for example, the National Treaty Commissioner's Office, which is also an independent planned mechanism uh, to be an oversight body for treaty violations. So, um, I think these, there's even the murdered, missing indigenous women and girls um, call for justice, asks for that independent oversight body so that maybe a merging of the three into one oversight mechanism, I don't know, but there has to be. Uh, and I say that because of experience from going to the UN and uh, with delegations for many years making complaints uh, and they're heard at the UN, yes, but there's no internal domestic mechanism that follows up on the decision of the treaty body. So you go there, you get a good argument, you're heard, but then you come home and there's no mechanism for follow-up to that decision of the UN or the other international body. So there must be that uh, independent and we have to make it ourselves, I guess, create it ourselves. but uh, we can move forward without at least having that oversight body. Thanks so much to all the panelists for, for those comments. Um, I'd like to ask, um, one of the big questions, the controversial questions, because even going back to Bill 262, which was Romeo Saganash's bill, we had a lot of debate uh, in, in the public realm, many voices uh, coming forward, not always with good information, saying that this legislation went too far. It, it shifted uh, the, the balance to indigenous peoples. And at the same time, we had other voices also, I think without full information saying it didn't go far enough uh, to protect the rights in the declaration. And I'm hoping each of you could weigh into uh, those controversies just a bit and uh, give us uh, your views on, on where you land on, on that debate. Let's start with Cheryl again. I'm gonna wait for the end for this one. Okay, let's let's go in reverse. Let's start with Willie and then go go back the other direction. Uh, can we, can you say that again? Just a question, real quickly. There's a debate between some. The debate between 
some voices uh, who say that uh, this this legislation went too far and she, and gave Indigenous people a recognized um, an, an unfair balance of rights for Indigenous peoples. Yet at the same time, we heard voices from others saying that it didn't go far enough to protect the rights in the Declaration. Um, I'd like you to weigh in, if you could, Willie, and tell us, uh, with the full information that you have and the experiences you have, uh, where you land on that debate. Well, first of all, I, was, I recall very clearly being told by members of parliament telling me, Willie, you cannot have better rights than us. So <laughs> that's one view. But then um, uh, having heard our own uh, brothers and sisters, I come down on a point of paramountcy. Our laws have to be paramount to federal and provincial municipal laws because of their, um, what would I say? I think um, Ellen may have said it before that our laws existed uh, since for, for a very long time, our traditional laws or customary laws or sacred laws or laws of nature, they have to take uh, paramountcy over a non-Indigenous law. That's where I land. So if there's a conflict between federal law and Indigenous, let's say Cree law, Cree law wins. If it's provincial law, Cree law wins. That's where I land. Thank you, Willie. Um, Ellen. Yeah, I, I, I listened to the debates on, on either side. I think there's an oversimplification of what this law means. And I think some, um, dare I say, is very racist. It's, it's fear mongering, um, I think, um, perhaps on both sides. I, I've heard that, you know, the declaration didn't go far enough. It's, it's like, we are living in 2021. We are dealing with climate change. We are dealing, we're living in a pandemic. The status quo and the norm uh, people are really trying hard to hold on to it. And what this legislation hopefully will do, and I'm not saying it's ideal and it's, it's far from being perfect. Uh, it is not the candrip. It is about implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Our rights were disrespected because we were not thought of as human by Europeans who first landed on our shores over 500 years ago. That attitude has never changed, even in 2021. We see that systemic racism continues to impact Indigenous people's health and well being in our daily lives. We see our land being taken, and we cannot do anything to protect it because we don't have tanks and armies to do so because the government doesn't want to listen. And I'm talking about provincial, federal, municipal, sometimes banned, um, because they've commodified something within indigenous law is sacred. And so I think that, you know, I'm like anybody, I'm cynical as anything when it comes to Canada doing something. Um, but when, when do we start to make the solutions? If this is a step towards the right direction so our people can live without fear uh, against the colonizer, at least the, the, the divisions within is, is, is a different story. But if we can protect ourselves from overcriminalization, uh, from the destruction of our environment, destruction of land, and then we can uphold our laws, if we have that freedom and ability to uphold our indigenous laws, and if this legislation can help it, time will tell. But I can say honestly and truthfully, I am, I am cynical, but I also want to see some progress to be, to be had. And, I don't think the Indian Act is, is, is an answer. I think we're all trying to get rid of the Indian Act. And if, if we're not going to do it through the UN Declaration, then what? So that's, that's my piece. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ellen. And now we'll turn to Cheryl. So I always come back to our human rights. And 
what's problematic with the way the Supreme Court of Canada in terms of how it analyzes our rights, they always have this justification to infringe section. So, you know, you have indigenous people who fought like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to get treaty rights recognition, finally get treaty rights recognition, but then the Supreme Court of Canada creates this test justification to infringe rights because of their placating of public interests within the protection of rights. So, you know, when Marshall decision came down in 1999 and, and the Supreme Court of Canada recognized uh, the treaty right to hunt, fish, and gather and make a moderate livelihood, we thought that would eliminate poverty within Mi'kmaq community and Willis Degree community in Atlantic Canada. But there's not one treaty right fishery happening other than the last two years because communities are saying, you know, we're going to go out and fish. We're tired of, uh, of, of trying to uh, work through the process that's being pushed on our communities to get rights for the fish. So when I like the um, I find my time that I'm alive that when there's a right recognized it's actually implemented right away and the right that is recognized is recognized without giving deference to public opinion public interest um, what what it what any right the reason why we are successfully arguing that these rights is because you know there is justice in the world there has to be ultimately at the end of the day justice in the world. And justice, justice means based on what is right and not is what is the will of the majority of other people who feel that their interests should trump others because of legal fiction that they've created um, to justify that, like, with our rights, these these are legal interests. So, I guess where I sit in on all of this is, you know, I think enough is enough. Really, you know, let's as Indigenous peoples, we do have rights, and uh, we gotta we've gotta be able to live them, and 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 have them be recognized and honored by all, not just not just by. You know, whoever it is, it, it's not happening as, as, as it should. And we know that. But there has to be a time when it does. And hopefully it happens in my lifetime. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And we are almost out of time. But I want to invite each one of you, all three, just to give us some uh, closing thoughts to walk away with uh, before we have to leave this this virtual webinar. Um, so could we, I know Cheryl, you just spoke, but could we move in that uh, Cheryl, Ellen, Willie, uh, just some closing thoughts and remarks to share with us. So I'm outside and uh, my family's home. My dogs are wrecking. So I apologize for your background. Thoughts is I really feel if uh, I really want to focus on the language and I want to focus on finding need to start advocating for and, and, and governments with the funding need to support um, language emergent schools in every First Nation community. And it needs to be fund, funded double the, double the amount they funded residential schools. If we get that, that's one step towards um, uh, rest, uh, reconciliation and, and, and uh, a little form of restitution. Thanks, Cheryl. How about for you, Ellen? Sorry about that. Uh, I just, you know, thank you for inviting me. And I'm, I'm glad to be able to, to speak. Um, I, I, you know, we just passed the 31st anniversary of the Gunasadaga siege, incorrectly named by the media as the Oka crisis. Um, we were shot at, we were almost killed and you know, since that time, there have been many struggles that have gone on fighting the same fight, even to this day. Uh, if there's going to be any hope 
of reconciliation between Canadians and Indigenous peoples, then there, this legislation really needs to be well understood, well talked about, not just as an afterthought, and to protect the Indigenous people's safety. Um, we are threatened from all corners right now. Um, where we, we, I think as a species, <laughs> we are being threatened by all sides. Uh, legislation is only words on paper. It's like the UN Declaration, it's just words on paper. It's, it's work of Indigenous peoples. But unless Indigenous people get behind it, and unless Canadians, Quebecois, all the other provinces, unless you guys get behind it and stop acting like spoiled brats and, and people who are privileged, um, we're not going to get anywhere and we're going to continue to fight. And I can tell you after doing this for as long as I have, Willie's been doing it longer, you get tired and you wonder what is wrong with people. Let's make something right. Let's do something good for a change. Because if we don't, um, I, I fear that all the things that we are fighting for at this very second will be lost. And I don't want to lose that hope. I, I think... I think what gives me hope is the people who are advocates like yourself, Cheryl and Willie and, and, and um, uh, all the other people who have worked on this declaration. Our elders wanted this, uh, our elders wanted the colonizer to respect us. If this is the way to do it, then so be it. But uh, uh, like Willie and, and Cheryl have said, indigenous law at the end of the day is the law that is going to be implemented and is the law of the land, as far as I'm concerned. So, thank you for allowing me to be part of this panel and to speak. So, thank you, Ellen. Closing thoughts for us, Willie. Well, I, in reflection, um, over the decades, I, I feel that the um, there's three things to bear in mind that are sometimes mischaracterized. One, of course, is the UN Declaration uh, Treaty and the calls to action or the calls for justice. Those are all solutions and they are directed solutions to advance reconciliation. And I think that for me, that's the objective for all of these efforts is that we will have true reconciliation either through the path of the treaty implementation, the UN declaration implementation, the calls to action or justice implementation. It's about reconciliation. And as I've said sometimes, um, it's about reconciliation. So it's time now for to go beyond the words. And I think as everyone is saying on this panel, it's time for action and it's time for our uh, lead to be changed to our direction. And I think that's a wonderful set of closing remarks uh, to leave us with this afternoon. Uh, so normally I would say if we were in person, please join me in thanking the panelists. So it'll just be me clapping. Thank you panelists uh, for sharing your time, your energy and your, your thoughts with us today. I know we all appreciate it. And to each and every one of the attendees who joined us from wherever you're joining us from, thank you so much for spending an hour and a half with us this afternoon to talk about and dialogue on uh, this quite exciting development of uh, national implementation legislation. So I uh, want to wish everyone a good evening or good morning, uh, depending where you are. Uh, this session of MRIP, we're all working very strange hours in order to be together at the same uh, time in the same place. So that means some awkward hours. So thank you for being with us. Thank you for your interest. And I want to wish everyone a very good rest of your day. Thank you.